Welcome to the Singers Symposium's Soaring Through Vocal Obstacles, sponsored by DebraLynn.org. Before we begin this evening, there are a few housekeeping items. Attendees are muted. The event is being recorded and all registrants will receive an email within a week with a video link. You can use the Zoom chat to ask questions, make comments, and communicate with symposium moderators. And we'll use the chat to post related information for you. And finally, a short survey will be provided near the end of this evening's event. Your feedback is appreciated, and we ask that you please complete the survey before you leave the Zoom. And now it's time to introduce Singer Symposium creator and this evening's host, Deborah Lynn. Hello, everyone. Oprah Winfrey is quoted as saying that everybody needs somebody to show them the way out or the way up. There was one performance achievement on Maui in 2003, a moment that redefined my vision of self, beginning a new personal vision and mission, if you will, to assist others, to help them lift to their desired heights of potential. Because of early trauma in my own life, I often felt like I had to fight for my dreams and aspirations. A seemingly endless variety of obstacles, vocal and otherwise, I needed to overcome. What I realized along the rather long and arduous journey to that singular moment of success was that some very special people had appeared along the path at critical moments who both bolstered my courage and renewed my emotional strength to believe in myself and the power of my dreams. For today's Singer Symposium, I've gathered a few of my heroes, inspirational colleagues, and folks that I feel very honored and grateful to call friend. As they share their stories and wisdom, it is my hope that you will glean nuggets of gold to hook on your own star, giving you a renewed sense of possibility for your own magical outcomes. So without further ado, let us welcome this illustrious panel. Nikki Blackmer. Hi, Nikki. So glad to see you today. Hi, how are you? I'm, glad to, I'm good. Glad to have you here. It was nice to see you in Phoenix as well. So this is going to be wonderful for us to get to share some more time together. It was definitely nice to see you in Phoenix. Awesome. Carrie Burns. Hi, Carrie. Carrie, it's been a while since we've connected, but um, we've we had a wonderful sort of extensive journey together for a while. So I'm, gl I'm glad to see you again and glad to kind of have your input here as to your, your breakthroughs and obstacles that you've dealt with. Great to see you. Great to see you. Sean Devine. Hello, hi, hello. Hi, Sean. How are you doing today? I'm doing great. And I was just getting up one of my favorite photos. <gasps> oh, I love to show. that. Oh, no. You know, it's oh, so yeah. funny. I, I always say to folks, whenever I think of Sean Devine, it just makes me smile. He just makes me smile. Well, huh. this and this is actually, if you remember, this is from the Midwinter Convention, January of 2020, just before the whole just world. Just before went, the whole world yeah, kind of upside down. Share some time and just uh, just great to be here with everybody. Thanks yeah, again for I'm asking glad, us, Yeah, you're welcome. I'm glad to have you here. Uh, I, you're an important part of this conversation. Marty Lovick. Good morning. Hi, Marty. Oh, good, to, good to see you. Good to see you. And lovely and to see you. I think the last time we interacted directly was Harmony University 2018. Is that correct? That, that's correct. And we, we shared a meal. And, and uh, as you are um, want to do, uh, I felt like I was the only person in the room when we chatted for <laughs> a long time. So uh, it, it was terrific. And I look forward to seeing you again soon. Thank and it's you. an honor to be here with this illustrious group. Uh, oh, I'm really glad you're here today, Marty. I know you bring a lot to this conversation. Nikki McGrath. Hello, my friend. Hello. How are you, my friend? It's yes. so wonderful to be here with you. It's oh, uh, awesome to have you back again at the symposium. And I understand you're a little bit in the cold north right now. So, so glad to see you with us today. Thank you, Deborah. Looking forward to your sharing. 
and Shauna Oshiro. Hello, Deborah, thank you for having me. Uh, hello, Shauna. It's great. It's great to see you. Um, it's been a while for uh, you as well, yes, in terms of the um, the, the time that we, we've had together. It's probably been a year, uh, well, maybe before COVID, since we've been in the same room together. Yeah, it has. Yes. And all your work, that wonderful work that you were doing through through Halo Quartet and uh, the diversity inclusion. Okay, we got we got some powerhouses in the room today to have a conversation. So I think are we all here now, Sue? I believe so. Yes, we are all here. So we're going to go ahead and start this conversation um, today with a question that I'd like to have everybody sort of address, which will get us all sort of oriented and started. Um, but you, you know, I'm going to ask who feels comfortable to start first and like that. So wherever, whenever you're ready to jump in, I will, I will um, call on you. So, but the same question for everyone. As you attempted to pursue your own aspirations, what is one issue or event that you faced in your journey that challenged you? Who wants to go first? Marty, can I call on you first? Yes, you certainly may. Let's start, uh, with, let's start with Marty and then Nikki, I'll come to you next. The, the first thing that comes to mind really is, um, for those of you who don't know me, I'm in the suburban Vancouver, British Columbia area, which over the years has become a hotbed of barbershop, both in Sweet Adelines and BHS for international champions. And, and we're so close to Seattle, we consider Nikki an honorary, uh, honorary Canadian. Um, but when I got started uh, back in the day, it was really an outpost of barbershop. And the biggest struggle I would say was that when we decided that we wanted to get better, we had to go to outside sources. We had to go out and research it uh, because there wasn't the challenge inside the, uh, the greater Vancouver area. So uh, that going out to schools, um, getting educated, doing everything we could, bringing in coaches, and trying to get more into the big world of musicality of the barbershop world. And uh, I think the proof's in the pudding in that when you look at the international champions and hopefully with um, Lionsgate soon to be international champions, uh, that was the biggest thing. So I see there are people here from like St. Albert, Alberta or, or Tel Aviv. Unfortunately, you have to do some reaching out you have to go sometimes to things, pay some money to get involved, to become immersed in this thing. That's, that, was, that was the biggest obstacle to start. And, and once you, now that you're sort of on the other side of it and, you, and you've got this culture around you, how does that feel? Well, it's, it's terrific because it really feels like a small world now. I mean, I have, the, like everybody else in the panel, I have the pleasure, the honor of traveling all over the world and coaching people. And it, it is great to be in Stockholm or Christchurch, but it's also great to be in a little whistle stop town in, uh, you know, south of Dubuque and uh, where there are 13 people in a chorus who are trying to make music you know, it, it, the whole gamut, that's probably the, what I enjoy the most is that I get to do it all. And, um, and, and it's an honor and a blessing. Awesome. Awesome, Marty. Thank you for sharing. Nikki. Um, I had a, I had a rough, I had a rough um, moment um, where it was probably, I, I had an, I have an opera background. I got um, a, classical music degree in uh, from Wake Forest in 1997. Then I came out to Seattle in um, 97 and I started grad school at UW in 1998. And in 2001, I went down to Portland Opera and I did a summer session there. They had like a summer vocal camp kind of thing for opera students. And it was three weeks and um, they had a very um, famous, 
a coach there who really coaches mostly at the Met. Like her, her, her uh, condo is across the hall from Placido Domingo, as she used to like to remind us all. And she was doing a master class, and um, which means we all sing in front of all of the other students. And she would coach us, and that's kind of very common in classical music upbringing. And uh, so we're kind of used to that. And but she was tough, so there was a little bit of nerves anyway. And I was singing a song, and she stopped playing, and she threw my music book across the room, and she said, "That is the worst singing I've ever heard. You have no place being here." And I was in front of like, I don't know, like forty. 40 students and we were adults, but like 40 students. And I remember just thinking like, this is the moment where you choose to either quit because this is what a professional tells you you should do. Right. Or this is the moment you choose to do it anyway. Mm-hmm. And I was embarrassed and hurt and pissed off all at the same time. <laughs> And I didn't quite know what to do, Um, but I guess the part down deep inside of me is too stubborn or stupid to listen. And I walked across and I got my binder and I walked back up to her and I said, well, I'm paying for your time anyway, so you should probably just play the song. And I forced her to continue on and she barely coached me, but she continued to play the song, which did not make me a friend of her which is fine, but it, it forced, it gave me the moment to choose singing and music and know that it was the right choice for me. And then the most amazing thing happened later on in that camp where I had a session with a performance psychologist and I, which is like a sports psychologist for anyone who doesn't know. And it was, um, totally life-changing for me because I had so many um, blocks of fear and not being good enough. And am I okay doing this? Is this okay? Is this okay? Just looking for um, approval from from everyone. Um, And I had a session with with them and uh, I had a huge transformation. Um, So it was kind of like the worst camp and the best thing at the same (laughs) the same time. Um, And it it made me choose uh, music and it made me choose my outlook on music and it made me choose how I wanted to treat others in music. Um, and so, yeah, that was my moment. Wow. That that's what, what, a, what a, a, a wonderful and horrible story all yeah. the time, <laughs> but you know, I, I, I won't ask who the teacher was, but I do want to say that I did an opera workshop in Portland one year with an opera singer from New York who was tough as a battle axe. And I wonder if we were in the same room. So I also struggled. If it wasn't the same one at the same time, I had the same kind of breakdown in that text you. Yeah, we'll, we'll talk, we'll talk. Okay. So, ah, awesome. Thank you, Nikki. Thanks for that vulnerability. Who uh, next, who wants to go next? Who's got that? Yeah. uh, Let me go Nikki, uh, Nikki McGrath first and Carrie, then I'll come to you. Oh, Nikki Blackmore, I could spend all day talking to you about stuff. And I'd like to go next because my story starts off kind of similar um, and kind of goes a little different. And this is, I think, for a lot of a lot of performers, a lot of creatives, there is similar variations to this story for a lot of us. Um, When I finished high school, I had dreams of going to this fancy conservatorium in Brisbane where I grew up in Australia and the day of my audition, I had laryngitis. I still went to the audition. It did not go well. So I, I didn't get into the school, um, but that was, that was okay. I was a little heartbroken, very heartbroken. However, I was happy to persevere and keep working on my craft and, and wait till the next round of auditions. So I started voice lessons with an illustrious, highly regarded kind of like famous ish voice teacher in Australia. It was a big deal. My piano teacher actually lined it up for me because she was a well-known music critic. So, you know, he kind of was like doing her a favor almost. So I started lessons with him and I was starstruck. And not long after that, I was feeling pretty lost in the world. I was 18, fresh out of high school, first heartbreak, all that stuff. 
and he looked at me one day and he said, Nikki, I just don't see a star quality in you. I don't think performing's for you. Maybe you should consider something in admin. Oh, wow. Yeah. And I'd been training all my life on a number of instruments, was performing at a pretty high level for my age and could, could sing. <laughs> and that's all I wanted to do with my life. So I left that lesson. I, I was stoic in the moment. I got into my car, I called my parents and I was like, I'm going to enroll in a business degree, um, which left them without words. They were pretty stunned, but that is actually what I went and did. I, I totally took a different course and that led me down a very different life for just over 10 years. Um, and I had a wonderful career in the corporate world. I work in, worked in event management and business development management and coaching. I had a great time, but it didn't fill my soul the way that music does. And after a bunch of trauma stuff in life, I started to really miss singing outside of my home and singing with other people. That's when Barbershop came into my life in 2018. And pretty quickly after that, I remember just being like, how do I do this all the time? How do I do this with all of, all of my time? always. I had a, a bunch of people also asking me with my chorus if I would teach them singing lessons. And I was a section leader and doing all the stuff. And I started to have a lot of questions about singing that I couldn't just answer myself and things on the internet were very confusing. So I was like, you know what, I'm just gonna audition for that same conservatorium, but to do a master's in vocal pedagogy. Because I think, I think that's going to light me up. I think that's going to be a good time. And I, I have a lot of questions. And so that's what I did. I quit my day job before I even got to my audition. <laughs> and I remember my first day of, of post-grad, they were like, yeah, so your first assignment's coming up. We'll be assessing your teaching. Um, so record yourself teaching. And I was like, record myself teaching, like singing, singing. And they were like, yeah. And I was like, Oh, so I guess I need to be teaching singing then professionally. Um, and so that's, that was the catalyst for it all. I remember my first voice lesson. It was with uh, one of my chorus mates back in Australia before I moved to Canada. And midway through the lesson, I just had this moment of realization where I was like, oh, this, this is beautiful. This is in flow. This is everything. I was answering a lot of the questions I had through my studies about how the voice works and how singing works. I was able to share that uh, in a caring way with, with other singers. And thankfully for me, there were singers really wanting to work with me. And, uh, and now I've developed the career I have. And I feel nothing but gratitude for the experience, much as it was really traumatic for 18 year old little me all those years ago. I, I mean, I think that voice teacher probably had good intentions, even though it was poorly executed. Um, however, I, I don't think I'd like to change the journey for me at all. Hmm. Yeah, it's, it is. And it, it notice it's, it's a journey. It's a, <laughs> it's, a, it's a journey. It's not a straight line. It's not a straight line. Um, Carrie, Carrie, thank you, Nikki. Thank you. So when I was in high school, I saw the fabulous Phoenicians, huge chorus. And I said, I want to do that. I was a, I was an instrumentalist, but when I saw that, I immediately shifted and now choir, school choir and everything was my drive. And when I got to college, I found a very small group. I was up north into a small town and found a barbershop group. And uh, I was going to college there. Well, at least I was enrolled in college. I don't know how much I went, but I was there for college. And uh, a friend of mine was directing and he was moving to a town on the other side of Phoenix to go to a big chorus. And of course, I decided to go and move because of the chorus. So I went and followed barbershop there and eventually ended back up in Phoenix. And I, I hooked up with a barbershop icon, Lou Perry. And Lou Perry helped to teach me, um, uh, you know, all sorts of theory. I used to go to his apartment. He'd pat the seat next to his piano and he'd 
make me turn around. He'd hit a note and then he hit a chord and say, okay, name the chord, name this. And he kind of put me through the drill and, and uh, he wouldn't take any money for it. I would just go every once in a while on weekends and help him run errands. Anyway, I was a barber shopper. It's like, this is what I want to do. So eventually, um, Lou Perry was ailing and I just got this, this foresight to give him a call and to tell him how much he meant to me and, um, and, and everything that he did for me. And I promised that as he helped me, I would pay it forward and help others through barbershop. And, um, so I decided eventually a few years later to go through the judging program. And I uh, got into the program, uh, did some of the preliminary work. I went to category school and we talked about scoring and we practiced and did everything. I was just soaking up everything. And at the end of that school, they talked to each one of us. And when they came and talked to me, it was, we don't think you're ready. And we're not sure if this is going to be for you. And I was devastated, devastated. Um, and they were right. As I, as I went afterwards and I said, you know what? I am going to work, 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 work. I want this. What, what resources are there? What can I do? And I worked like crazy. And uh, after a couple of rounds, I went back into the program and that time I flew through it. Wow. And, you know, that was, I, I look back and I wasn't really ready the first time, maturity wise or knowledge wise or people wise. And when I went in the second time, I was much more ready to accept everything, not only with putting down, you know, a, a, a correct score that, that reflected the, the performer, but more of the evaluations afterwards and the connection with people. And then further than that, coaching and, and everything from there. So now I've been a judge for 12 years and absolutely love it. And it has afforded me the chance to go and coach all over and meet new people and just get these relationships that I don't think I could have gotten in any other business in any other place, but to make all of these connections. And now at home, I direct four different ensembles, very different ensembles, and I give voice lessons and I coach and I'm just having the time of my life. I don't think I would have been here had I not failed early yeah. and really pushed myself through it. Yes, it's, it's interesting, isn't it, that uh, failure can be a great teacher. Not easy to go through emotionally, but absolutely can challenge us to become our best self, yeah? Uh, Shauna or Sean, who's on? You ready, yeah. Sean? Oh, will, will, let's give it to Shauna and then we'll come to you, Sean. Yeah. Okay. It's funny because all of these different kinds of stories, I'm like, did I understand the question? <laughs> what is the question again? But, Shall I repeat it for you? <laughs> um, I mean, we're talking about the challenges in uh, that really were uh, critical points in our journey as a series, yes. Um, and I've had, you know, many different uh, similar points, um, especially uh, along with the Nikki's, also with the background in. Uh, opera and classical voice training. Uh, barbershop is one piece of my musical life and uh, classical singing is the modality and the way of the way of singing that feels most um, like my whole self is inside of that. Um, and I think the the moment that feels like the most representative of the challenge in my journey, um, I when I was in college, the, let me see, I'll try to start with, out of high school, I was accepted into, you know, one of the fancy, like, you know, Peabody Conservatory. And I went there, you know, I moved into my dorm and I was enrolled and I always had like um, a difficult time feeling like I belonged in any particular place, you know, th through high school, 
I wasn't necessarily, I wasn't like a dork or a bully to that sense, but it, I didn't necessarily felt, feel like I easily fit into any particular group. And this was the first time I was like, oh, this is my Hogwarts. Like, I really <laughs> feel like I belong here and I'm going to do all the things. And this, this is such a beautiful place and I'm going to grow here. And then um, financial aid fell through, yada, 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 I had to leave. So I had, you know, made I'd made friends and again, felt like I was where I belonged for the first time in my life. And then that was ripped away. So fast forward. And then I enrolled at Morgan State University because I had, you know, my tuition was fully covered and all that. So I was like, well, I'm not going to have that problem again. And um, this is um, HBCU. And I don't know how much anyone knows about Morgan State University, but their choir um, is legendary, especially from the legacy of Dr. Nathan Carter, um, who passed away the summer before I started attending. So um, the way he directed and led was very much, <laughs> he was also known for throwing things <laughs> and insulting <laughs> people in front of the entire choir. And it was just, um, and it ended up kind of, for a number of years after his passing, it was a little bit, there was a residue of that kind of tradition of like, this is how we treat each other. So even while culturally the assumption might've been like, oh, well, I fit in more here, like, oh no, absolutely not. And um, they could be very, very cruel. And I remember there was, um, so the moment I'm describing is I had a solo in one of the pieces that we were performing in the concerts that we were doing. And, you know, I'm up there singing it and I can hear them laughing behind me as I am performing. Oh, wow. And, you know, I, I do the thing and, you know, I, I lived and everything. And that wasn't like the only time that I experienced or perceived, um, you know, these voices from all manner of directions saying like, you're trash, <laughs> you're not good enough. And like, you don't belong anywhere. <laughs> like, I hate your mother for having you is one of Dr. Carter's famous quotes. Um, oh my God. It was just like, the fact that it couldn't stop me from needing to do it was just one of those things like you know what you described Nikki it's like well I have a choice to make here and this is who I am and, and um, this is what I'm going to do and I think you know there were more times similar to that before that there are times after that there are surely times to come when I'll be faced with that again because the challenge of you know trying to sort out how I am perceived in my singing or however I'm presenting myself and what I intend and what I want to bring, you know, that's an ongoing challenge. Um, and I think, you know, one of the gifts that I like to imagine, because I also think that um, this is what I believe is like sort of my assigned vocation for this life, <laughs> um, that, you know, there's something that I'm meant to learn about myself about life itself and everything that is through the process of singing and like you know the idea of like even just alignment and chakras and all of these things um wholeness and vibration um and so I've come to appreciate that even though I would there are definitely times when I would just love to like I just wish that I could get it completely right at least once and like, you know, be able to do like, you know, what these people who it seems to come so naturally to them. And I work really hard to try to get a little bit better every day. Um, but I'm actually also grateful that I have ha had to continue to struggle and work and to seek because it helps me to see the things that I feel that I'm really meant to see. Um, you know, the, these people that, you know, there's a conversation people describing like, why would anyone do that? Like, why would you throw like, first of all, how old are you? Why would you do that to another human being? And we miss, I think that there are things that they miss out on just being excellent. Like if you don't, if that same struggle doesn't happen, you, you don't get to see these things along the way, like, you know, as you pace yourself. So while you know, if, if the day should come where I'm, I'm doing it right, you know, yay, that's wonderful. Um, and I'm also grateful that I get the extended journey to seek excellence and beauty. That's awesome. Awesome. Shauna, 
Yeah, and and how much it has uh, that continuous journey continues to carve your growth emotionally, spiritually, yeah, yeah, pragmatically, and as a singer. Yes, wonderful. Thank you for sharing that. All right, Sean, we're coming to you. Yeah, no, I do. I just love how um, every one of us is speaking uh, to this. As um, I can tell, each of us are still students of this game. No one here on this panel has sort of hit the point of, I just figured everything out that I need to know. Like we're always constantly, I, and I think we're here today, not only to share what we've learned along our own journey, but to be fed, you know, and inspired by uh, everyone here on the panel, everyone here in the uh, in symposium here. So um, I'm again, grateful to be here. And so many of these stories resonated with me, uh, being an instrumentalist kid, drum major of the marching band. You know, I had already auditioned for music school on the euphonium. Uh, the day that I was handed my first piece of barbershop music. Yeah, you know, I was in musicals and choir, but I was not going to hang out with those choir people. I'm here to be in the <laughs> band and it's very serious business, you know, but the second I rang my first barbershop chord my senior year is like, how do I get to the person at the university to let them know that I don't want to be an instrumentalist anymore? I want to be a vocalist. It's just, I just knew um, barbershop was the vehicle that brought me to vocal music. And um, I had performed in uh, theme parks. Well, I, I should also say that the story of the, the audition that went horrible or the ran into the educator who just absolutely challenged you in the most unhealthy way. Um, every one of those uh, stories hits me. And, and certainly I had pieces of that along um, my personal journey as well. Um, I, I think for for my portion of this conversation, I'll just say I wanted to speak to a, a more of a technical preparation um, uh, event that I, I found out that I needed to do for, for a long, long time. I would just show up to the um, to the rehearsal uh, or to the gig uh, just ready um, for what, what are we going to do as a warm up? What is the group going to do to get ready? Uh, and I wasn't taking the time for me to make sure that I was being prepared either from a a mental preparation standpoint or a block and tackle on my phrasing notes and words, or honestly, maybe most importantly for this conversation, the vocal warm up. I was just showing up and whatever was presented to me to, to get ready for the gig is it's kind of what I did. And the journey um, for me changed when I developed, uh, I developed a polyp on my vocal fold. Um, I just was not taking the time. I was not being selfish with me and what I needed. Um, once I realized what that was like and what I needed to do to get warmed up, to be in a great vocal spot, uh, to be prepared, to be open enough to connect as authentically as I could to my music, to my fellow performers, to my audience, um, that's something I like to speak to uh, whenever I'm doing vocal coaching, uh, ensemble coaching, um, any kind of visual design. It's like, uh, what are those blockers? Uh, have you done what you need to do uh, to access all of that? And um, when I rehabbed back from the surgery, I had that. Um, I went to the Vanderbilt Voice Center. I was living in downtown Nashville at the time. There's a very famous surgeon. Uh, Dr. Bob Ossoff uh, actually invented this type of surgery to remove the polyp. And I was just given a whole new lease on my vocal life from uh, vocal um, rehab, vocal and voice, so speech and voice singing um, rehab to get back and just learning so, so much about my voice, what I need to do to be ready. So now when I show up to a rehearsal or an audition, um, I, I've already done what I need to do before I walk in the door. Um, it helps me be more confident. It helps me be more aware. It helps me be a better ensemble singer. Um, I don't do much solo singing. Um, anything I've done worth anything has been part of an ensemble. So um, that's one thing I'd like to leave with today is just uh, everyone knowing exactly what they need to do uh, from a preparation standpoint to be as um, open and, and healthy and uh, ready to um, connect again to your fellow performers, to your music and to your audience uh, as, as you possibly can. Oh, that's that's fantastic, Sean. And, and you know, as, as I'm watching the conversation, which ha has happened in past symposiums too, it's just where we're all kind of, you know, it, it just goes to show our interconnectedness, you know, and, and the similarities of our journeys and what we have to deal with as human beings. Um, I, I have as well uh, moments that I can recall where I was challenged externally from someone challenging my desire to become this singer. I remember 
uh, having singing in my soul very, very <coughs> young. I decided at the age of seven, that was going to be my profession. And by the age of 11, I was out there doing it. And at the age of 17, I was in a car accident with my mom and dad. And I think this will help when, when you see tears come out as I'm doing some of this, part of it is I am still on the journey of recovery in my own being from the challenges that I have within self that are keeping me from my outcomes that I desire. So I share this with you um, just so, you know, maybe just so you know a little bit more about Deborah Lynn. But at 17, my, my, the right side of my face was scarred significantly. And uh, for the next 10 years, it was incredibly visible that I had had 50 or so stitches across the right side of my face. And my professional dreams at that moment felt like they were just gone. It wasn't, it was, it wasn't that someone said something or anything. It was like my life has just intervened in my desire to achieve. And I will tell you that those next 10 years, which included a college professor saying, you shouldn't pursue this, that I had people telling me don't. And all I knew is that inside my heart of hearts, I could do no other. This was who I was meant to be here. So it didn't matter that I was dealing with, okay, the world doesn't, doesn't exactly know what to do with a woman who is scarred. So I'll tell you what I did right the very first thing I did, because for, for even the people around me at the time, they were sort of shocked and dismayed. But I think it was my like Nikki facing into it and facing into that instructor. I um, right after the car accident, I came home to a mailbox that had a letter in it saying that I was going to be one of uh, 10 or 12 contestants in the Connecticut State Junior Miss Pageant that year. And there are almost no words, but what I will tell you I did is I did it. I walked through it. And I remember walking into the room with these other young women that were competing in this comp contest and them looking at me like, oh my God. <laughs> and I was like, oh my God is right, but I'm doing this. And I, I sang and I sang and I, st I stood in some courage within self that said, keep going, keep going, keep going. Like Shana said, keep going. It doesn't matter what's happening externally. Um, and the growth and the development over the years has been extraordinary. But I will, I will say that to actually arrive through my training through turning around from my career in Europe um, after getting all this bel canto training and going to Europe and them telling me I was singing all the wrong repertoire and me looking up and going, well, I don't like opera that much. I'm gonna take a U-turn. <laughs> so, and then I landed on Maui where I was embraced and loved and healed over 12 years with this, this process internally. And because of that standing on a stage on Maui because I was so safe in that world there and people embraced me as I was, it didn't matter that I wasn't perfect or that I didn't look perfect. To them, I was perfect because I was me. And I feel like fundamentally, every person that's in this room that's sharing, that's what radiates out of you for me. So, so, so here we go. So let's go into a deeper dive, not to take you down the emotional path, but I think the emotional body for most singers, maybe you all could speak to this, is, okay, you get all the technique and you figure out the technical and this and that and the other, but then what is it that keeps you from actually getting to where you want to go? And I, I'm going to suggest, yeah, Marty, usually it's yourself. <laughs> so, so I've heard everything I've ever learned that's important in my adult life. I've had it reasserted just in the discussion so far. So maybe I, if I could just kind of just point out a couple of things that what I'm hearing is that everybody in this panel, to my understanding, when we coach and work with people, I believe we have a transformative model. There's a lot of coaches who have a transactional model. And yeah. the transactional model is here's some low hanging fruit. Uh, lift your soft palate 
um, et cetera, you're not getting it right yet. And, um, and don't get me wrong, vocal pedagogy, all that, all that stuff is really important. But the things that we haven't really looked at in this panel and many people that I hang out with now are working on is how about having a transformative experience? So what is challenging that transformative experience in many cases is, guess what, imposter syndrome. You know, when Carrie talked about um, it was devastating to be told that at the end of the process. Now, on some days, <laughs> some days I wake up in the morning and I assume the rug is going to be pulled out from under me. You know, I assume I don't know what I'm talking about. And on the other hand, we're, you know, we're also supposed to be putting ourselves out there, be authentic. So there's, there really is some crazy making going on, mm -hmm. but it turns out that sharing our own vulnerability, and I don't mean victimization, and I understand clearly when we say to certain people, it's about being vulnerable, their life experience is about being victimized. And um, when we look for the strength of vulnerability and that it's about the audience, experiencing something where that they're afraid to ask about that we've already gone through but if we're not as coaches going through it and owning up to it and then and learning to do it like i have a history of clinical depression and one day the one of the most effective things that was told to me by a psychiatrist was marty you're not a basket case you just feel like one so and my my head exploded and, and he just said, you need to be surrounded with people who understand that you're, you feel broken, but you have something to offer because of that experience. And so, and I mean, I don't, I don't sit down with, with quartets and go through some kind of counseling exercise, but on the other hand, maybe I do. You know, it, 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 it is kind of, we're in this together. So, so my background, interestingly, I look at the, the less than, I am a journeyman, rock and roller, rhythm and blues, uh, nightclub, uh, age 17, uh, wh white middle class kid from Vancouver, and um, uh, hanging out at age 17 in rhythm and blues clubs, and, and just sort of soaking up music. So I look at it from the perspective, sometimes if I sit down with these people who are all brilliant and they're the master's degree and this, that, and the other, but I figure out what is it that I bring to the table. Mm -hmm. And the one thing is that I understand where some of the music came from that we're singing and that the answers are in that music. They're not in the barbershop constraint. They're in the music, that the original place of the music and it's an organic. So that's a whole bunch of stuff. But that's what <laughs> that's that's what I'm bringing to the table. And I know I can see now how it fits together with everybody, because at various times in the process of coaching, we pull on on different sides and we need to pull on different sides because performers and singers learn in different manners. They integrate information in 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 many ways. And so um, I'm here to learn. I'm here to learn. And every opportunity I have to coach is a learning experience. Yeah, and, and very well said, very well said, Marty. Uh, you know, this the, the combination of technique and transformation, and it really is both. It's both. So so who who wants to go, who wants to add something into this conversation before we go to the chat? Because I know there's people with questions that I can see them popping up, but uh, Sean, anything you want to add to the? Sean or Sean? Sean. Uh, me? Oh, yeah. I, do. I have Sean and Shauna. I just slipped for I'll a second. I'll be a little there. more careful. Okay. <laughs> what, Sean. From your chair, Deb, like what's the best way? What do you, I mean, perspective wise? Well, I think there, we're going to, to I think we're going to dig in as we go forward into some specific things like you've brought up um, this vocal right. healing and health piece. I know Nikki probably has some relational stuff into that conversation as as does Nikki Blackmer and and Shauna as well, perhaps. Um, 
the transformational piece, I think it's sort of like obstacles are multidimensional. Maybe that's the piece here is that there is, there, there is a, you know, sort of have you to be a multidimensional, you know, yes, there is fundamental technique that we're trying to lay into the process so that we have the skill to be able to stand on the stage and do what we do. And then there's the next level, which is the artistic, which starts to get a little bit more nebulous, right, as to how are we a performer and how are we reaching our audience? And Marty said something earlier, I think, before the call started about how are we perceived by others? You know, that that takes us into that realm. And then you have how do we achieve the results we desire in an overarching way, knowing that it's not going to necessarily happen today, but it will happen if we keep taking steps forward. Yeah, and I, when I was signing on and, and we played that cut from that OC Times CD, I joked, I didn't know there was going to be a second song. And after the first song, in those few seconds, I started to say, I wish I could get a time machine and go back to that kid singing on that track and like have him sit in on this uh, because there was a lot of vocal trauma happening there and there was a lot of lack of confidence going on there and a lack of, uh, I hadn't yet had my, I think I knew I had the polyp, but I hadn't had the surgery yet. I was, I was scared about the surgery, of course. And I thought, well, maybe I can work around it and let's see other ways we can minimize the polyp. And then finally just realizing, yeah, you have to have it removed. But um, it's, that CD was probably recorded in 2007. And um, I just, I wish I could go back to him. And um, it's the experience that we pick up along the way, you know, Um, and it's, I don't think that singer back then had fully realized what he had to do uh, from a, I'll go back to the preparation standpoint. Um, I don't think that he, he walked in fully prepared to be his authentic self. And I think that's the biggest blocker. Somebody spoke about it. Marty may have said the imposter syndrome. Um, I, I never walk into the room thinking I'm, I, I'm probably the best singer in the room right now. That will never be a thing that'll ever happen to me. I, I'm sitting here like, if I can get out of this session without everyone in here thinking I'm a fraud, oh, wow. I will have accomplished my goal, you know? So I, I have to say that I have been out auditioned. I've been out sung, but I rarely, since having that realization and going through that, have been out prepared. Uh, I will sit and prepare and study my music and uh, find out what I need to do, um, learn the other parts as a director, um, do the full research on the song as a designer. Uh, but me, Sean, walking into a room, I know selfishly what I need to do to remove the biggest obstacle in the room, which is me, <laughs> to get that out of the way. I know what I need to do selfishly from a preparation standpoint before the singing happens to make sure that I'm able to bring my most authentic self to to connect most authentically to everyone I'm sharing the music with, including the audience. Yeah. And, you know, I, I, I dare say that no one would ever think that of you. And yet, isn't it interesting that that's how we internally feel within ourself? You know, uh, yeah, yeah. Uh, transformational conversation later. I want to go to Nikki Blackmer real quick. Thought as I was watching you and Nikki McGrath, I've got you on my radar. Insights to the, the, the piece of the transformational journey versus the technical journey. It's both obviously, but How do, you, how do you inspire someone to walk through the frustrations of the technical journey so that they will take the transformational journey? I guess maybe that's my bottom line. Uh, Nikki, either Nikki. Uh, I don't. Okay, I have about 17 things happening in my head at the same time, and I just said them all. So it's a I'm multi-dimensional start, reality. I know, I'm gonna start maybe with one thought. Um, I, I was at, uh, in Phoenix and, um, <clears throat> there was, there were different levels of prep for each chorus that was able to perform there because of the pandemic, right? Like some of us got together really soon and could perform with or without masks or rehearse with or without masks. And some of us didn't get together until like this year. 
and start rehearsing. So there was a definite like level, different levels of preparation for everyone. Um, and I know that some choruses like we're like, we're not as good as we used to be, or we don't have as many members or whatever. And I found that I was being really moved and having tears in my eyes from not necessarily the best performers on the stage. Right. In fact, most of the performances that were moving me the most were not from the choruses that were in the top 10 at the end. And it's because there doesn't have to be perfection in performance. Like you don't have to wait until your technique is at a certain level to then start like performing, right? Like the, the, the technique and the performance can happen simultaneously. Like you can learn while you're performing and then you can like, get better and then keep performing at the same at, you know what I mean like they don't have you don't have to wait to start performing your 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 level of uh, technique can be any level to perform at and to give your best at you know and to try to connect um with the audience at at, at any level and then um you will get as your technique gets better your performance results get better because um you're not distracted by some of your technique things that have gone wrong during your performance you know your your oops bucket as i call it you know as mistakes go by you can put them in the bucket faster than at the lower level where you're distracted by them per se um so for me i think that the the key to know is that you're not wrong. You don't have to have a license to perform. You know, you can <laughs> you can start at any level and just because you're not perfect or just because you're not at a B level or scoring, you know, with a 6 in front of your score or whatever like that, it it doesn't mean that your performance is going to be not as good as someone else's. Like I have found very moving performances in lower level groups because they connect to it and they make me connect to it. Um so I think that that has to just, we have to start trusting ourselves to start opening ourselves up to the performance level, regardless of the skill. Yeah. I love what you said about like that search for perfection that will cripple you. I, I mean, it's, it's impossible. So stop. Uh, there's a quote that I've used a couple of times. It's Gustav Flaubert it would maybe be his last name. It's artists, artists who seek perfection in everything are those who cannot attain it in anything. And that really hits home. It's like, you're, you're chasing this perfect thing that's impossible. So just be real and be authentic and let us see you. And that's it. Mm -hmm. I love that, Nikki. It's awesome. And what we can do together when we are there in that space. I think that's what you're yeah. speaking to, Nikki, that we witnessed on the stage when it was just the fact that we were on the stage and we were getting that, that emotional rush from the performance that we just, were actually here. Yes. Just saying like, this is where, where I am or where we are right this moment. And that's good enough. I don't have to be different than who I am right this second. Like, I'm just going to show you what I am right this moment. And sure, next year, maybe I'm better, but it's not next year yet. And everyone might be better <laughs> next year. So here's what I am right this second. And that's okay. Whatever that is, it's good. It's good yes. enough. Exactly. And uh, Nikki McGrath, you want to add something in? I think what we're going to do here, folks, because we're getting ready for the break to come up. I just I just had my little conversation on the side with Sue. There's a lot of questions from you all that we want to answer. So what we'll do is we'll take the break, come back, and then we'll be all about them. So so don't go away. All right. Um, Nikki, anything you want to add to this before we take our break? So much. Um, <laughs> so much. Um, I'm a, a vocal pedagogue. That's that's what I do as a job. And I, I teach at a co like I'm a college professor and stuff. So it's interesting when I work with groups and we get into the stuff, we're doing what we're doing. And they're like, I thought we were like here to coach singing. <laughs> and I'm like, this is that vocal pedagogy is not just like voice science. It's actually a combination of things. It's the art and the science of teaching singing music is art and we're here to create art and i often have to remind myself of this one too because i am super technical and in, in my brain and how i process information 
Um, and I remember during, during my postgrad studies, I had a wonderful, wonderful voice teacher, Dr. Irene Bartlett. Um, and I, I sing contemporary, like contemporary pop, popular music, musical theater, that kind of thing. And she looked at me and she said, Nikki, if you're singing, uh, if you're listening, and I am listening, then who is singing? And it hit my heart bone, something fierce. I just about burst into tears with how much it moved me because I'd never really considered how I was like listening and micromanaging and making all these little adjustments. And it was a really powerful lesson to me in that moment that we work on our singing technique to build our core foundational technique, whatever that might be, to support us in creating the art that we desire to share with the world. And so we need to have time where we're thinking critically, um, objectively and kindly, but also analyzing and working on technical stuff. But we also need to be in the practice of getting out of our way and just singing, just performing, just being, just being human and sharing our art with the world. And I, I often will have that little mantra to myself, if I'm listening and you're listening, then who is singing? And I, I, I love sharing that with other people as well. Yeah, and I think that that technical, the art, adding in the human, mm -hmm. because we're all coming from our life experiences, some of which have been traumatic, some of which have been joyful, and and we're we become our own unique presence, our own unique performer as a result of all of the culmination of that. Yeah, Shauna, anything you want to add before we get ready to take the break? And Carrie, I'll come to you next. <laughs> Can you repeat the question for me? <laughs> <laughs> well, you know, if you're if you're you're talking about now, are you do you you do you coach as well as sing now? Are you you're coaching within the context of the work that you've been doing within your organization? Vocal coaching as well with your I I've never asked you that question. Yeah, I haven't um I've never coached a quartet and I have not coached um individual singers for um, for a good while and they were always um, younger um, but so that's that question and what is the so so I for me with you it's that because there you do deal with and work with people who are trying to break through restrictive internal and external circumstances in order to achieve mm -hmm. who they're here to be yes yeah. so I'm asking you a question about that like where we get stuck yeah <laughs> um, I'm trying to distill this to something that would be digestible because the answer is still so, so abstract, but um, I'll start with the big one that comes to mind, which is that the thing that ego will always get us stuck. And that doesn't mean um, like being conceited necessarily, but being only uh being so embedded in your own perspective and your experience that you're not aware of the fact that you are connected to everyone and everything else. And so like, you know, what uh, Nikki was saying about, you know, that if, if we're both listening, who's, <laughs> who's doing the singing. And it's really interesting. Like it's this like sort of quantum weirdness where you've probably also, um, all of us have probably seen this where there are some times that you can um, describe the physical attributes and the, the anatomical um, information about how everything is mechanically interacting in the process of singing and like as accurately as possible until you're blue in the face. And if there's not, for me anyway, I found that if my, um, if I'm only in the concrete mode of like how to do this and it's not inspired and not connected to the moment of, you know, what's being communicated, it, for me, I can't, it doesn't work. <laughs> like, uh, yes, I do practice. And I, and I, that's one of the things that gets me stuck, the more I'm thinking about how to do this, right. And it's, it'll always get me in trouble. It never fails. Like if I'm like, okay, here comes the note, I'm going to do it. It, it. it never goes as well as it could. So I think the truth and the freedom that we seek in vocal production and singing um, really is all in release of stuff. Like it will naturally line up. That doesn't mean that you don't have to work at it. It just means that 
freedom actually is a natural thing. Yeah. We have to unlearn all the other stuff. So there's an answer. -ish. Perfect. That's a, that's a <laughs> lovely, lovely answer. Thank you, Shauna. Carrie, you want to add something into this before we take our break? Sure. I think, I think trying to be perfect is, is really hits home for so many of us. Really quick story. In the 1980s, MIDI came along musical instrument digital interface where we could connect computers with the uh they weren't keyboards back then some of them were keyboards but they were big things that you put up on the rack and you could recall sounds you could actually push a button and it would make a trumpet sound on that pitch um, at that time they were kind of weekly trumpet sounds they weren't you know sampled wonderful sounds that we have today but um but it was it really started to uh annoy the music industry industry because they said this will make perfect music and it's going to put musicians out of business because you could tell the computer to quantize or to put all of those rhythms exactly where they're supposed to be and they they were saying music you know the musicians are going to suffer and but they didn't because <laughs> we don't like perfect music that music was so sterile so much so that these days in those same programs, there's a button that you can hit that says humanize and it actually wow. makes it imperfect by a little bit. It doesn't make it as wonderfully imperfect as we do, um, <laughs> but um, but the, the humanness is part of your product. It's part of you. It's part of what we want the audience to hear and feel. If we do perfect music, then we're saying that we want the audience to be impressed. But if we do heartfelt music, we want the audience to be moved. Yes, right. Oh, wonderful. Yes, Nikki. I just want to add one thing to that. When Frenzy did our, our CD, we've only done one CD, but we intentionally did not auto-tune a whole bunch of stuff. And in it, there you'll hear like we're out of tune at spots and there are mistakes at spots and we intentionally didn't fix it because that's what we did. And we had so many people coming up to us or uh, talking about us on the backside about how it wasn't as good as all the other CDs and Frenzy's not very good and we weren't perfectly tuned and how can you believe they won and all this other stuff. And we, we really did do it intentionally because we were kind of tired of hearing everyone else so perfect. So you'll hear us at the end of like, you know, you just hear us from time to time saying like, that's a choice <laughs> and it's it's just it's human so uh it's you know it's it's it was one of those things of like do we do we do it really really well or do we do it how we could do it and we just chose how we could do it well and 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 isn't that fantastic for those on the journey that are struggling to get that tuning to work. It's not easy to tune barbershop. If this was an easy sport in four part harmony, you know, it, right? It, it, this is, you know, some people, I don't know what it, what was it? Deke Sharon said, it's a black belt of acapella. It, it is the black belt of acapella and it requires enormous sort of tuning skill that takes time for the human body to feel, yeah? So, all right, well, I think we're gonna do this, everybody. We're gonna take the little quick break. Um, Sue, from behind the scenes, can you tell us how long this break is going to be? Five minutes till Five show time. Minutes. Awesome, and then we'll all meet back here and we'll start taking your questions from the house and they'll everybody will be ready to respond to what you want to know. <laughs> 